And I'm like rejoicing because I sense the fellowship and the spirit there. And I come back and give this wonderful report. Like, hey, I met this brother. He goes to uh, that Baptist church over there. Like, man, we were able to minister. And all I'd ever hear is they're not in the truth. They don't actually have the Holy Spirit. They're not saved. So that was really messed up to me. Not because like I didn't agree, but it's like, but I recognized enough evidence that they are Christians. Like the ministry, the fellowship of the mm-hmm. spirit, the rejoicing about Christ, the work in the Lord. And I was always being told this, 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 just because they're not in the assembly, they don't have the right mm-hmm. baptism, they don't, they wear the wrong clothes. Because I'd be worried about your soul, why you still be doubting you got a soul? Like you need to see to believe these things, but you believe things that you've never seen, like feelings and hopes and dreams, the future emotions and gravity, and sadly, everything you're rejecting makes this whole life a tragedy. And I got something to say, I got something Welcome to Welcome to the Milk and Me podcast. I'm Leslie. And I'm Andrew. And this is the first time that I'm joining my husband on the show. Nice. So the purpose of this episode is to introduce myself and to speak briefly about how I came to Christ, a little testimony, and finally talk about how we both kind of decided together that it was time for us to leave our home church and start new i guess i don't even know what how to ex- explain it yeah yeah it has come to our attention that we i have uh quite a few audience um people that follow me on social media they've they know where where we came from and you know they've pretty much noticed a little big changes in our lives that we've been sharing on social media that we're not in the same church um and uh and I keep getting questions. So we thought, you know what? It's time for us to get on here and talk about it. Yeah. So you ready? I'm ready. All right. All right. Brief intro. Okay. So one misconception I get a lot is people think that I grew up in a church, which is not true. My childhood was very unreligious, very broken, a lot of drama, heartache, and high school, freshman, sophomore year, very rebellious and I truly believe that's one of the reasons why my mother began looking for God Mm -hmm. seeking God to bring peace in our home maybe order and uh, so she she found the apostolic assembly church but she didn't I wouldn't say found Um, I have family I already had family established there every now and then they'll invite us I have quite a few memories going as a little kid but my mother never really fully committed uh summer i don't even remember what year it was i just know i was finishing sophomore year going to junior year in high school i went to a youth service and i remember it was a pastor from lake havasu arizona very strong preacher you know those ones that yell and shout Mm -hmm. um all I, all I could say that was my first experience. Um, I didn't even know what to say. Like, I went in there with an open mind. I was curious. I was forced. So I was curious to see why is my mother pushing church to me? Like, she's really pushing this. And they were talking about it was a youth service. So it was in, you know, the target was to teenagers, trials, burdens things we carry and that there is a God that loves us, a God that is, he knows those burdens and he can lift them off if you just accept and believe. And the preaching was very moving. It was touching my heart. And I just remember feeling completely like warm, like hot. It got really hot. Like if you get nervous, start getting sweaty. And I'm like, what is this? Like, what is this feeling? And it was time for altar call. Altar call is when you go to the front. Yes. Of the right to the pulpit. And that's where people pray and do other things. Now, I was kind of, I don't want to say forced. I was encouraged. Um, because, for, first of all, this, was, this is a charismatic church. Do you want to define what charismatic is? Uh, charismatic is when there's like an 
animation to to this style um it, it's 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 basically the opposite of wooden or kind of like really statue like uh, in posture and temperament charismatic is more exuberant more outgoing which is fine it's hyper charismatic that we're we're cautioning and saying this is not it where people um intend to look for the feelings as an evidence of the presence of god or the confirmation or affirmation from heaven like you have to do this or respond in this certain specific outward way or else you are not being touched by god so it's the belief that if god ever does anything with you or moves in your heart or is among you in essence you're gonna act out some people will wig out some people will fall on the floor some people will shake some people will scream some people will do cartwheels and backflips at the altar <laughs> and they'll say that means god is here and if that's not happening god's not there so in essence so um so it was hyper charismatic hyper charismatic charismatic is nothing wrong with it hyper hyper that's the so in this uh during the service i noticed a lot of hermanas a lot of sisters that were speaking in tongues that caught my attention and i know that's what kind of got my mother in curious i think so when it was time for altar call, I was I was shy, but I was encouraged to go because they had women there to what would you even say usher you there yeah. like there is a pressuring for yes. people to come forward like like that is that is the that is why it is considered a hyper charismatic church. It is basically like the result needs to be you externally acting out. Um, so, so that's it's like you're looked at and kind of frowned upon like come on come on come on come on <laughs> if you don't come up to the altar so that's the hyper charismatic aspect of it so i was um i was encouraged and i was pulled in the in the altar call and uh i just remember just standing there looking around because there was a lot of young people crying some of them were on the on their knees and I could just hear all the sisters in the background praying over us and speaking in tongues. And this pastor was like, within his preaching, he'll speak and then speak in tongues. And I would just be like, what's going on here? Like, what is that? Not trying to be all obvious and rude, but I was curious, like, what is, what's going on? Because this is my first church service. Like, I've never gone to church. So I was pretty open because you know i'm here i made it my mom got me there mm -hmm. so now all this stuff is happening i'm curious i have questions and i'm there i'm left there standing and i'm just encouraged to pray you know talk to god that was the main focus talk to god know that god is there listening and i don't know what happened i began crying i just know the preaching did touch my heart but I didn't start crying until I got to the altar call. Now I, now I can understand that it was because I was surrounded and you just get really emotional. And I just began crying. And it was the, the preacher's wife came up to me. It wasn't a member of that church. It was the preacher's wife, the guest preacher. She came up to me and she put her hands against mine and she just began telling me do you want to receive the holy spirit and i was like i just gave her this look i didn't give her a response i just gave her this look like what are you talking about like what is that and she's like repeat after me and it was so loud i i swear to you i did not hear what she said i don't know if it was english or the speaking in tongues what they prefer to the holy spirit but it was so loud because everybody was speaking, screaming, crying, speaking tongues, I mean. And I don't remember copying what she was saying because I couldn't hear her. I just remember the moment she touched my hands, I felt this heat. I felt something inside me. And it didn't scare me because it felt, it felt unreal. 
I just got more curious, like, what is this? All the way from my feet to my head, and I became, I began to shake. I was shaking, and my hands began to shake, and she began to speak in tongues really loud. And I remember my mouth shaking, but I don't remember saying anything. Mm -hmm. And she probably took that as she has it. She has the Holy Spirit. She's speaking in tongues. And she turned to the preacher, which is her husband. And when she said, this young lady has the Holy Spirit, she's speaking in tongues. So all the attention was on me. And I just had my eyes shut. I just started crying and I, I kept shaking. And that was it. I The service was over. They were praising the fact that a guest, an unbeliever, received the Holy Spirit. That was amazing. They, they all came up to me to say, hi, welcome, congratulations. And I'm just like, for what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like in my head, I'm just confused. And I, I, I want to understand what happened. And I remember the preacher's wife came up to me like, you are someone special. Know that this is not... It doesn't happen so too often. Just know that you are someone special and God gave you a gift and don't ignore it. Pursue it. Pursue God. He loves you. And I did feel special. And my cousin who was a, who is still an active member in the church, she's been there for years. She was there in the, during the service and she got so happy to find out that her cousin received the Holy Spirit and I'm not even baptized. That's a huge thing that you do not be baptized and receive the spirit of tongues is very un- uncommon. So I was getting hugged. I was getting a lot of like, hi, I'm in this so-and-so, so-and-so and congratulations. And I, I felt special and I remember asking my cousin like what happened like what is the holy spirit she just gave me this smile like i'll explain later and that was it that was my first encounter in the apostolic assembly church a youth service where i apparently received the holy spirit of tongues (laughs) yeah without even knowing or understanding the gospel yeah i had no, no no studies at all just a random stranger (laughs) You know, I can imagine um, that that correlates to the idea of like um, when like they marry off in some cultures, like a young girl uh, to a boy early on, and then later they're told like you're married, mm-hmm. and they're trying to figure out what what do you mean? Like they don't understand it. Like something has been brought upon established on someone without their knowing without their real actual involvement that's kind of what happens you know what's interesting is when i think about this uh, there's there's so much so much to be warned about there's so many red flags just in that entire description um you don't receive the um you don't receive the holy spirit (laughs) without hearing and believing on the cross of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and your own repentant faith toward God in Christ. This isn't something that's given through a tap to non-believers. It's just, that's just not it. Uh, you'll see like street ministries with people that are hyper charismatic mm-hmm. and they'll go and say, Hey, do you want to be healed? All right. I'm going to give you the Holy spirit. It's like, what are you talking about? Like, that's not it. The Holy spirit is not this like energy that's, that's shared <laughs> through through touch you don't get the holy spirit um by wanting to be healed of a sickness um the holy spirit is literally god residing in you because he's changed your heart and brought you to faith in christ no one accidentally has the holy spirit no one has the holy spirit and doesn't know who god is that's the thing because the holy spirit literally gives us the mind of christ literally gives us a knowledge and a fellowship with god like you can't have it and be like who's god What does this mean? No, (laughs) you're going to know exactly um, what's going on. So that's that's interesting. (laughs) Well, from that on, my life completely changed. Mm -hmm. I don't know how quickly um, things were in place to get Bible studies with the pastor. I believe I went to another youth service, but it wasn't a big one. It was just the local church hosting so I just remember my mom very excited 
and I was just like, I was a teenage girl. Come on. Okay, cool. Whatever. Even though in the back of my mind, I was like, what was that? Mm -hmm. But, you know, you go to school the next day, you forget about it, live your own life, continue living your life. And um, I was already turned off by the idea of ever committing to this church because of the rules. Mm -hmm. My mom, out of nowhere, just woke up one day and said, I'm going to get baptized. We're going to go to this church. And I truly believe it's because she noticed that she needed to do something because I'm the oldest. And by sophomore year, I was already coming home late. I wasn't coming home right after school. We didn't have cell phones. We were just living life. You know, my mom was a single parent. She had to work a lot. I had to help around the house, help with my brother. And it got to the point where I was tired of doing that. And I just wanted to do my own thing. My brother was already just to himself, you know, locking himself in the room, playing video games all day. So I didn't have to be worried about him. He knew how to feed himself. So um, one day she just says, I'm getting baptized. Well, first, before getting baptized, she wasn't allowed to get baptized. She had to get married first because she was in a long relationship with my stepdad and they weren't committed. Mm -hmm. So he followed her. He they, they, they got married. And then right after they got married, they got baptized. So that was interesting. And for that reason, I was like, oh, no, I am definitely not getting baptized in this church. They just forced my mother to get married. That sounded silly to me, but she will bring up the whole experience that I had. Like, mija, you're special. You should look into it. Like, maybe God's trying to tell you something. Maybe he's going to use you. Like, not everyone gets to have that. And... And that made me feel special. And I'm like, okay, I'll continue going to services. I'm just not going to change my wardrobe. I'm going to wear makeup to the services. I'm going to wear my jewelry. And uh, yeah, I don't know how quickly, but it, I, I, I requested Bible studies from the pastor because I needed to know, okay, why all these rules? That's all I care. Come on, I'm a teenage girl. Why is it a sin to wear makeup, wear jewelry? wear pants like why is that a sin and i had my bible studies i even invited a friend from school and she had a hard time understanding too but the pastor answered her questions he explained the doctrine and you know i'm i wasn't rude i just listened to him my mom's in the background praying over us that god would open up my heart and after that study i just in my heart i i, I wasn't fully convinced but i was convinced that there was a god i knew that after you know about i i believe what they said about the holy spirit the tongues and i knew from that was my proof that there is a god there's a higher being i just didn't believe it was just in that one church because it made no sense like how are my friends are gonna, gonna go to hell if they don't believe I, I just had those little questions in the back of my head so because of being in high school and my friends, I had a lot of doubts in the apostolic assembly, but I just couldn't stop thinking about the Holy Spirit, you know, speaking in tongues. That was the only thing that just kept coming, making me go back, like giving it a chance, learn more. And it was just that one night, that one night that I uh, accepted Christ. It was late at night. God gave me a sign. And I knew, okay, God, you're real. Okay. I, I like, thank you. <laughs> thank you for saving me. Thank you for choosing me. But I just don't feel comfortable going to that church. I just, something doesn't fit right. But thank you for real, um, showing me that you're real. So... That was it. I accepted Christ, but I wasn't going to get baptized. I told my mom that I believe in God, but I'm still not sure about the church. But I, I'm making a deal with you. I will go to Sunday service with you. Just don't push it. And then out of nowhere, my brother, who's in the not even involved, he's involved, but my mom's not concerned about him. She's concerned about me because I'm the one 
bringing trouble into the home, you know? Uh, he wakes up one day and says, I'm getting baptized. And I'm like, what? He had a dream. And he and I'm not going to share his dream because I don't really remember. I just know that he said that God wants me to get baptized. So I'm going to get baptized. Wow. <laughs> okay. So that's happening. My mom's excited. And I'm like, no, I'm not getting baptized. Then something else happens. My aunt and four cousins they started going to the church, but I had no idea they were even like intrigued or interested or loving it. They all decided to get baptized. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, when did this happen? First my brother, now my aunt and like three or four cousins. And these were close cousins. Like we, we grew up together. We did everything together. And I'm like, whoa, that just brought more, in a way, just confusion and stress like peer pressure because I was like my mom wants me to get baptized everybody wants me to get baptized now this no I'm not gonna do it I'm not gonna do it I kept telling my mom no I'm not getting baptized Sunday comes turns out family who are also in the apostolic church in Mexico they came all the way to Yuma to witness our family my brother my aunt my cousins to get baptized and that was a huge thing. Like, we don't see our cousins and aunts from Mexico come over here. We usually go to them. So that made the whole atmosphere in the church even more special. It was a very, I remember this day, it was a beautiful day. The praise team was doing their best songs. People were praise breaking, speaking in tongues. And I was in the spirit. I was jumping, clapping. I could feel the Holy Ghost. And I wasn't speaking in tongues because I was kind of like, I guess in a way, not inviting it. Um, but I could feel my body getting, because every time I felt my body get warm, I knew that was a trigger. Like it's about to happen. And I was kind of like scared because I wasn't sure. But I think I let I let go. And that's when I realized I can't miss this opportunity. I can feel the Holy Spirit. I need to get baptized. So I tell the pastor, I'm getting baptized today. Okay. So that was even a big surprise. My mom got her prayer answered. Everyone's like, Leslie's getting baptized. Leslie's getting baptized. Our prayers are answered. So it was me and my brother, my aunt and my cousin. It was a beautiful day. And yeah, that, that was it. It happened. <laughs> Um, I remember going into the water, it just, it was a beautiful experience. And, and I can say that if you accept Christ, getting baptized is a requirement because God commands it. It doesn't matter where it's, it's, it's beautiful. Like you remember your, your baptism, right? Mm -hmm. I remember feeling so light, like something lifted and I got emotional. I was crying and my life changed. That moment I knew the Holy Spirit had a grasp of my heart and I just completely changed overnight. Like I gave my whole makeup collection to my best friend in high school. She was like, no, you, you did it. You got baptized. And she's like, yeah, wow, well, good luck, you know? And they supported me. I became that Christian girl in high school. I was, I was that girl in high school junior year wearing long skirts no makeup and i was quiet i was the quiet i was always shy but i was not embarrassed and i got quickly involved in the church and yeah that was it that was it for me i got hooked um that means i committed i was obedient i accepted the doctrine in the apostolic assembly church with no questions because i i was just I was in and that's it. That's it. That's, that's my story. <laughs> What's your story? Oh no, no, we're not doing my story. <laughs> <clears throat> my story would take too long because I'll give too much detail. Um, okay. So how does that lead up to us departing from the assembly? We got married in 2015. So we, as a married couple, we stayed in that church for two, three years. And that this is, this is on you right now. Okay. Four years. Um, when did you start 
looking into questioning? Um, I've questioned doctrine for a long time. Um, and I, like yourself, I flew all the way in. Um, God got a hold of me. Oh, that, that'll be for another day. Um, but he grabbed a hold of me and I began to pursue everything that the church was teaching. Um, what the interesting part was is that God was already working and sanctifying my heart for the entire seven first months of me attending the church. And I was still being constantly told, you're not saved yet. You haven't been water baptized. And I was still living with my ex. So I couldn't get baptized comfortably until we were married. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that. I remember that that was said to me that you receive the Holy Spirit, but you still need to get baptized because yeah. God won't use you. He won't bless you. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good point. Now there may, there may, there is some aspect of truth to that. I mean, if you don't obey God on mm -hmm. the basic principles of the faith, uh, he's, he, he can use whoever and what are, he uses dirt. He uses evil people. Uh, but your, your relationship with him is not an obedient one. If you are choosing to disobey. Now, if there is no ability to get baptized. It's a different thing. If there's no ability to do some things that's different. Um, but if there's the ability to obey him in the basics or the obvious things that he's teaching from his word, uh, we are commanded and our relationship with him will be hindered if we don't obey in those basic things right. at least. So there is that aspect. However, we were being taught that you're not saved yet mm -hmm. until. So that's the false teaching. Um, so I was going through changes and people began to praise and acknowledge the fact that, you know, that white guy or that Russian guy in the Spanish church, like that new guy, like, man, he changed so fast. And I didn't know that people were like talking about it until people used to say like, oh, people know about you. I'm like, know about who? It's true, because at this time, I wasn't in Yuma anymore. I had moved to Tucson, Arizona. Mm -hmm. So I met my husband while I was like away. And it was such a big deal. I even heard it all the way in Tucson. Like, yeah. oh, there's this Russian guy that came. And it was a really awesome testimony. Right, so it was it was weird for me to have people that met me and be like, oh, are you that Andrew? Mm -hmm. and I'm like, what do you mean? So I didn't understand the commotion. Um, God pulled me out of addiction. He pulled me out of uh, using foul language. He pulled me out of uh, bragging and wearing like the $600 belt just to show off. Like he changed my dress style. He changed everything in my heart and it wasn't forced upon me. There's some stuff I thought I needed to do, so I tried really hard externally, but there's stuff that he did in my heart that was just natural. He changed the way I speak, changed the music I listen to, changed the shows I watch, changed the way I wanna dress, the way I wanna talk, the way I wanna act, and who I'm talking about, because I began talking about Christ. So he did that in me, and I knew like God is working in me, but I kept being told, you're not baptized yet, so you'll still go to hell if you die. So it was odd because I had an actual ongoing relationship and a prayer life with God, but I was always being told, you're not, not yet, not yet. So the, the false teaching is the fact that water must cover you for salvation mm -hmm. to take place. That's the false teaching aspect, and it, it, it leads people's lives. Um, I, uh, I was sold on the doctrine for a little while, and I had so much of questioning because I wanted to make sure I got everything right. Uh, I wanted to like study the different teachings and stuff. So I began to realize that I was finding brothers and sisters in Christ outside, outside. of the apostolic church. Yes. And this that was is a like, big one. yeah. And it was like, this is not like people that say I'm a Christian have a cross on their neck. I'm talking about this is me going and evangelizing because that's something I was doing really heavily in the first few years, especially. I would just go out with the homeless, whatever, and I would go out there with Bible tracks and whatnot, and then I'd see other people. So there'll be some people going out with Bible tracks, some people going out with food, with water, just going out, reaching out in the same areas. And we'd connect, and we'd give our praise report. We'd give our testimonies mm -hmm. of Christ. We'd have the joy in our faces mm -hmm. of Christ living in us. We'd have our faith in Christ. And I'm here like, no rings, no nothing. And they're there, and they got a wedding ring, or a bracelet, or a necklace, or, or pants, or whatever. And I'm like rejoicing because I sense the fellowship and the spirit there. And I'd come back and give this wonderful report. 
like, hey, I met this brother. He goes to uh, that Baptist church over there. Like, man, we were able to minister. And all I'd ever hear is they're not in the truth. They don't actually have the Holy Spirit. They're not saved. So that was really messed up to me, not because like I didn't agree, but it's like, but I recognized enough evidence that they are Christians, like the ministry, the fellowship of mm -hmm. the spirit, the rejoicing about Christ, the work in the Lord. And I was always being told this, 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 just because they're not in the assembly, they don't have the right mm -hmm. baptism. They don't, they wear the wrong clothes. The Trinitarians. They're Trinitarians. It's like, that was it. That was the disqualifier. If you believe in the Trinity, you're out. Mm -hmm. If you wear rings, you're out. If you don't have the baptism with Jesus' name proclaimed over you, but instead you have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit proclaimed, you're out. Mm -hmm. If you haven't spoken in tongues, you're out. Like there's so much out, but the Bible doesn't teach that. Mm -hmm. And that's so I was searching the scriptures to see why am I seeing and experiencing in ministry. I'm not talking about like homeboys just hanging out, eating a, eating a sandwich, like, oh, he's a Christian. Why? Because I just like him. He's my friend. I'm talking about this is ministry. This is real. And I was always being told. So I began to study uh, baptism, uh, faith, salvation, um, God. Uh, what is the Trinity? It, what is oneness? Um, and I began to come to conclusions that we are being taught things that aren't in the Bible. And little by little, it weighed down on me enough where I began to, to have some, uh, I'd say, a rebellious attitude, meaning I was no longer convinced, uh, even though I love the pastor, love the ministers, the this people. is my people, uh, I ministered with them. We'll I would be in service and my husband will lean to my ear and like, that's not right. Yeah. The, well, and he'll be correcting the preaching. I'm like, shh, be quiet. Well, because there were some <laughs> statements that were made that were unhealthy, mm -hmm. wrong, and unbiblical and can't just kind of like, oh, whatever, it's fine. No, it's not. So there were some statements that were coming off and I would regularly do that. Uh, That's when some, I began to see like, yeah. hmm, something's going on here. So uh, it took a while for me to actually start stepping out, but I started calming down my hyper-legalism, started understanding things, studying, uh, studying doctrine from... Uh, you know, Trinitarian sources. Was this in year 2018 before we got uh, pregnant? I mean, I have, I, I have, I've used to email myself articles that I wanted to keep because I just wanted it in my email. And I look back now, I'm like, I have emails from 2014, like oh, two wow. years into the assembly. So it's like, I, I, I was studying, we even got married. yeah, I was studying baptism, salvation, um, who the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. is. Like I started, I had reformed resources then that I only now know like, oh, that was and solid. And you weren't sharing this with anybody. No, I was just doing my own studies. Um, me and, me and you know, me and Aldo, we once tried to figure out, is there, a, is the Father and Jesus two different people, even though it's one God? Um, and we got nervous, so we stopped looking into mm -hmm. it for a while. So it was interesting. Me and Carlos used to talk about the Trinity didn't know uh, how to argue for or against it uh, successfully because the Bible gave so much evidence. Mm -hmm. But um, but when I uh, when I came to those conclusions and I realized, hey, we're teaching speaking in tongues incorrectly, um, it was time to go because we had a few conversations with the leadership, and they didn't go well. There wasn't any. Um, there wasn't a genuine Bible searching answer. I was just told I'm wrong. That's it, basically. Um, and the next sermon became an attack on what I was asking about. So the problem was that I brought up real concerns and I had an entire three chapters of the Bible, like exposited, like breaking down word by word by word and saying, this is how it's supposed to be done. This is what it's saying. And here's what we're doing at the altar. Uh, the Bible says only one person can speak in tongues at a time, three people max in, an, in in any service, and only one at a time, but only if they have one interpreter at least. So it's literally like, how many people can speak in tongues at a service? Three people, <laughs> one at a time, and someone has to interpret everything that's being said. And I kind of just asked like, hey, this is pretty clear. Why do we have 15 or 20 or 40 people at the altar? apparently speaking in what they call tongues. And nobody's translating. And no one's translating. And the answer I was given is, it just happens. So you have to let God do what he's doing. And look, it says here, you can't forbid the speaking of tongues. But I followed through with the following part of that same verse saying, but let everything be done in its proper order. Mm -hmm. So Paul was not teaching in 1 Corinthians that if God do, does something, he's going to violate his word. 
um, and you kind of just let it happen. God never violates his own word. So the problem was I was being shown that scripture isn't actually being prioritized. The experience was, and if scripture speaks against the experience, then scripture needs to kind of just take a back seat. So that's impossible. You can't do that. And I wasn't able to conclude and agree saying, oh, you can just ignore scripture if God does something special, special at the altar. He's going to break his own scripture. It's like, that's not it. That's, uh, that's Stephen Furtick theology. You know, Stephen Furtick said, God broke the law, the law for love. No, no, he never broke no. the law in any case, way, shape, or form. But that's that kind of theology. God will violate scripture. God will, um, you can't put God in a box. That's what people say. And I'm like, I, yes, correct. You cannot stop God from what he's going to do. However, God puts himself in a box, meaning he says, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm not going to violate my own word. He puts himself in his own self-appointed box. So when God says he's going to do something, he keeps himself within those limits because that's his law, his word, his promise. He says it. It's not us saying, oh, we're going to squeeze God into a box. It's God saying, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to do anything that goes against this. And we have to remain faithful to the word because that's the only box we have, the limitations of God's rule and, and his preferences and his plan is all spelled out here as much as we should be able to interpret it from this side of heaven. So there's supernatural, mystical things we'll never see, uh, stuff that he's doing and who he is and how he is that we'll never understand. But the things that we are supposed to understand, he gives us specifics. And we have to stay restrained to those specifics as much as it depends on the context mm -hmm. of the word. So um, push, came, push came to shove. I did more investigation. I realized uh, at least, at least the speaking in tongues and the Trinity are taught falsely in this church. We have to leave because we can't work with this. So we booked it. I'm pretty like well, spontaneous. Slow, slow down, slow down. So a lot's happening here. He's already had like more than a year of doing his own studying, questioning how the church is preaching and teaching. I have no idea. I'm clueless because till now I realized that I was so distracted in ministry, the titles, because I was involved. I was involved like every year and we got married. We had kids. Now even I'm now I'm even more distracted. You know, I'm in the church, the nursery ministry started doing that. And I won't lie. His questioning scared me. I thought he was crazy. I was like, oh Lord, my husband's going to hell <laughs> and he's going to drag us down with him because I truly believe in submissive. Um, that's something that they teach us really, they teach strongly to all the women and the young girls there. Um, and that's a episode for another day, oh, yeah. what submission really is. But um, I love my husband and I'm going to follow him. There was no question about that. But just know this, that I was clueless. I had no idea that he, he was doubting in our church. So this was a huge shock for me. And I was really trying to keep myself together, not to like, like, get, get spooked, like, get scared, like, tell him you're crazy. Um, I was just kind of like, okay, let's pray about it. Let's, let's talk to the pastor or someone. Let's see who we could talk to. Um, but yeah, it's just letting you know that, that I was not, <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. So where are we at now? You've already decided. Yeah. I don't remember when you officially, like, I think he's been, he was slowly letting me know that he wasn't happy a whole year. Cause I remember I will call my best friend on the phone who's from out of town and I would tell, and she's from the Apostolic Church. And I would tell her, like, you know what? I think my husband wants to leave. Like, he, these questions. And I'm not scared. I'm praying that God will prepare me. But I honestly thought he was just over the Spanish because we went to a Spanish speaking church. We, every now and then, we had English or translators. And I was thinking that maybe we would just switch over to an old English church, Pentecostal or just 
English Apostolic because they did open one that year. No, he was like, no, I'm done with this doctrine. Like, this is not biblical. It's not right. So that was the other shocker for me that we were literally leaving the oneness. You know, Jesus is one. We were leaving the Jesus is the father theology. Mm -hmm. That's false theology. That's not biblical. Jesus is not the father. It's very clear in scripture. So we left everything that teaches that. Yeah. So I was, uh, we thought maybe Pentecostal. We tried thinking about that. He, I, but then we he, realized he like, visit one, right? yeah, it's but it's thing. like, same thing. And I was like, this the is the same hyper charismatic stuff. Is like, women are, men and women are allowed to have their wedding rings yeah. and the women don't cover their, their head. Their so there's head. no, there's no head veils. No hats. And you no. can wear rings. But I was like, I wasn't going for non head veils <laughs> and rings. Like I'm not leaving because I want to wear more stuff. <laughs> like that wasn't, <laughs> that's not what I'm aiming for. I don't, I'm not like mad at pastor. Like pastor, I want, jewelry i don't care about that stuff <laughs> i wanted the bible to be preached correctly so we had to leave the entire teaching and that was the hard part because we built some real relationships mm -hmm. real real relationships that even now to this day are some of the realest relationships we have um but we lost a lot of relationships when you leave that church the teaching is now this is why there's some sort of a cult aspect to it um, cult means a deviation from traditional Orthodox Christianity. Anything that teaches about Jesus but breaks some of the fundamental, like, un, um, non-negotiables of the Christian faith, that's a cult. Um, like Jehovah Witnesses, they teach that Jesus isn't actually the Son of God. He's not actually God. He's like half deity. He's more like an angel of um, a, um, the archangel Michael in disguise. Lowercase g for God, for Jehovah Witness. Mormons teach, teach that Jesus is the spiritual brother of Satan, and they're kind of like homies. <laughs> and you can become God and own your own planet and do your own thing in the whole universe, and everybody can become God. Um, being married helps you to get in special parts of heaven, and wearing holy special underwear protects you at the moment of death, makes you holy and clean. I mean, that's a cult. Um, Catholicism is a cult. It's the uh, it's the great cult of the Queen of Heaven that uh, the Old Testament speaks about, because Catholicism worships Mary as queen, as a mediatrix, as the mediator, female mediator between man and God. Jesus is kind of like too pitiful. Mary's way too loving. You can't overcome Mary. She's amazing. So it's the entire theology of worshiping Mary. She's God. They give her like you're the highest. You're the most holy. So they teach that. So that's a cult. So everything that teaches something wrong about Christ or Christianity in a, in a main fundamental way is considered a cult. That's the cult. Cult mentality is this. When you separate from the cult, you get shunned. And we got that. Mm -hmm. That's messed up. It's messed up because these are people we've ministered with. These are people that we've prayed with. These are people that we've walked out the Christian faith with. Uh, and the minute that we've said, hey, this is wrong. We can't teach this. This is wrong teaching. Um we, we were, I get blacklisted in essence, right? Yeah. And I knew that would happen because I've been in the church longer than he has. And I've seen it happen. And they always say, don't reach out. Don't because, I mean, reach out. Just like, hey, we're thinking of you, praying for you. We miss you. Like a text. But like spending time because you don't want to get corrupted yeah. for the reasons why they left. Because they're obviously going to a different church. So I, I knew that would happen. I, I was ready for that because like I said, he's been kind of giving me hints. And thankfully I had my best friend so I could vent to. You. So I was also getting prepared. Like She wasn't talking about me when she said best friend. Just yeah, no, either. no. <laughs> I'm not her best friend. <laughs> he is my best friend. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> but um, just to have someone to talk about this, it was a good way to mentally get prepared prepared emotionally yeah. uh he wasn't prepared i don't think you were ready he nope. you you were shocked oh I was he was away. shocked he was like i got i, can't I got they, yeah. they won't talk to me anymore i didn't get phone calls answered i didn't i, I was immediately blocked mm, and unfriended sad. by a lot of people on, on facebook to me that's like my way of communicating with them so that's mm -hmm. like basically saying like you blocking my phone number mm -hmm. um because social media for me is literally a way to connect with people um so it was interesting to me because when i got pushed away from um, I would, you know, I had a job that kind of connected me with everyone. Uh, I was working as a firefighter. So 
I would uh, end up meeting at the hospital with my friend Carlos. He's he's my brother, but he's here at the podcast now. But he uh, he was like strongly opposed. Um, and I was telling him like, hey, this is it. And I was breaking down the doctor and explaining this is why I couldn't stay. Um, so it's like I kept seeing him almost every night, like four in the morning. We got some ambulance calls and I'd be seeing him because he ran security at night. So I'd see him at the hospital. We'd talk. And it, 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 it slowly warmed up to where he started actually listening to what I was explaining and started doing his own research. But at first it was like, it was like a year. Dead silence. A year yes. of silence. So I just, I just went to my studies. I started building a library and ended up being wonderfully useful. Started studying doctrine, uh, started understanding, met some uh, pastors that left the Pentecostal church, uh, met some uh, met a lot of ministers. It's funny. I started meeting a lot of pastors all all out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. I literally, That's I think, true. had like within within a six month period, I think I met like five or six different pastors, just just somehow, and uh, started talking to them, explaining, asking questions from all the different denominations. Baptist, uh, not, we don't have Southern Baptist here, do we? No, uh, Presbyterian. Um, we even had some uh, Orthodox. Um, reformed non-denominational just pastors from all all walks of of the christian life and uh, it was interesting to kind of work through this and explain my my qualms with the apostolic pentecostal doctrine and i was glad to hear people like do a well and and solid job at explaining that my grievances were biblical and that I wasn't just this angry, mad person leaving. I, like I was trying to explain, like, hey, I'm being told that I'm mad. I'm being told that I'm hurt. I'm not hurt. I mean, my relationships with people that that hurt. You know, losing those. But I didn't leave because of any hurt. And I was like, hey, did I, you know, did I leave for the right reason? Like, is this the right thing to do? And they're like, yeah, you can't stay in the place that teaches the Bible incorrectly, especially in these big and dangerous ways. So. My my peace came over me more when I started realizing like this is this comes with it. This is part and parcel. It, this comes with you separating from an unhealthy and unbiblical or doctrinally unsafe church. You're gonna get this kind of feedback from them. Uh, so this this insight from those pastors and ministers that I've connected with, uh, talked through, that was a blessing to me. That's when I began to kind of just push forward and uh, started thinking about what it means to start speaking on these issues. And this podcast was born. I recorded with that blue mic that only worked for three or four recordings. What a waste of money. Best Buy did not do me well on that one. (laughs) Um, The recording in my closet, just me and the mic, just speaking a little And that's when I told him, you need your office. And I built him this office. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we left. We left. Um, I would like to share that. When announcing to our families, my parents, and that was funny. Some close friends as well. I did get a lot of bad advice. Now, as a woman, as a wife, I would, I will get, I would tell. Please, just tell your husband to tone it down. Tell him not to talk to my husband, or. They would tell me, hey, you know, you don't have to follow him. You could stay here and you staying here committed and with prayer, with fasting, you could bring him back. You could get him back to the assembly. And I know where they were coming from. There were good intentions. But in the back of my head, it's like, no, I can't leave my husband alone. What if he finds Oh, another woman who believes what he believes. My insecurities began coming like, no, whether this is scary and I don't agree right now, I'm going to follow him. But it quickly, I began to listen what he was saying. And when my mom would ask me, like, aren't you reading? Aren't you guys reading the Bible? What's what? Where's the confusion? Where am I? And I will tell her, I'm like, are you reading? Because everything that Andrew, like my husband, is telling me, it makes sense. It contradicts what the church is teaching. And I have so much peace now to talk about the true salvation to people. Like, I am embarrassed now. The many women I've talked to telling that they're going to hell. 
because of of your makeup and your wardrobe that yeah. that is oh, i'm so i'm so sorry if you're watching me <laughs> yeah it's amazing that that's some of the stuff we're ashamed of now and I'll, i'm not ashamed of the fellowship i've loved it yes not ashamed of yeah. the the deep worship that we've been led to aim for it's the it's the teaching that you must be on your knees crying and that's the only way you're getting deep with mm -hmm. god it's like i'm I'm, I'm fellowshipping with God in depth when I'm reading and studying and at times he leads people to cry and at times he leads people to, to, to fall on their knees. But you can't teach somebody that they must practically drop to their knees in order to worship God. Mm -hmm. um, there is that humbling of the heart that takes place, but uh, it's the hyper charismatic. It's, the, it's forcing people to do something here in the body as if that brings about a result. But the starting point is wrong. It's teaching people, put on that veil, take off them rings. There, now you're holy. It's like, no, no, no. Holiness is something God creates in the heart by his Holy Spirit. As he makes you holy, he takes you and you become part of the ecclesia, the called out ones. You become part mm -hmm. of the church. You become in the body of Christ. You are brought into the body of Christ. You're brought into that fellowship of believers by salvation, wonderful grace. And that holiness of God pulling you out of the world and making you different begins to result in a different attitude, a different dress style, a different uh, demeanor, a different temperament. All of that exudes, comes off of your life. And there are many things that begin to come off. Um, Things like obsessions, things like priorities start changing. So if women were like, I gotta get my nails done every single day, and, and that woman becomes a Christian, you might see her skip a few days on nail day. You might see her abandon that entirely, realizing that was like an idol to her. Yes, external changes will absolutely take place. However, that does not automatically say, oh, makeup and nails are sin. No, idolatry is sin. <laughs> And if any of those things are your idols, they will change. For me, showing off, wearing really nice clothing, uh, look, trying to look like people need to notice me, that was my idol. So when I came to Christ, what he changed in me was the way I dress. So I finally went to Walmart and I spent like 300 bucks loading up a whole new closet of Walmart style clothes. All the Burberry was gone. All of the Armani Exchange was gone. All of the true religion uh, brand wear was gone. Like I got rid of all that stuff, all that overspending, like that, that pricey attire. I got rid of it because that was my idol. That doesn't mean you can't wear a nice pair of jeans, a nice pair of uh, pants or shoes. It means if that's your idol, then you are commanded to get rid of your idols. Just like mm -hmm. Abraham was commanded to leave the place of idolatry when he, uh, when he was brought out from there, from, Ur of the Chaldees, and he became the first follower of, of God. So, so yeah. <laughs> and uh, I had peace, and I will also mention this: that what really got me, what like what really changed my perspective, was when um, Andrew started teaching me about the speaking in tongues. That one was a big one for me. Not only was that was was that was the one thing that got me involved in the church got me attracted to know who jesus was learning that it's not of god that it's it's something else but knowing that other churches like practice it they invite that spirit that got to me i was in denial i did not want to believe it and it's a very hard one and i truly believe that's one of the reasons that a lot of apostolic christians don't want to accept because i've spoken to some that have left the assembly but at heart they're like oh no that's the holy spirit because mm -hmm. i received it i was one of them and I, that's my confirmation that god's real mm -hmm. but i'm like but it's but it's it's not in the bible and how would you explain these other people that have no christianity and they're doing the same thing like Mormons and Hindus and Jehovah Witnesses, we we found and video clips, and we ha we will never have known if we didn't if Andrew didn't start reading more and studying because what we're told is don't look outside, 
Don't study external resources,、yes. especially from Trinitarians. So I would never go and Google like speaking in tongues. Why? It's I have it. Why do I have to question it? So that really got to me.、Mm-hmm. It took me a while to accept. I was very upset. I was very disappointed in myself, but that opened up my eyes to realize I was so distracted that I, I was not really reading the word. I was literally just reading my daily word to say I read the Bible today, but I wasn't in it. I wasn't studying like my husband was. So when he brought that up, I understood. I saw the videos. I prayed. I cried. I got mad. I was like, okay, this is it. This is this is real. This is not okay anymore. I, I'm on board, and we didn't. And here's another misconception.、Um, we didn't. How would you say this? When we decided to leave, it was quite quite a weird experience. I was still kind of like, let's not like expose that we're leaving. Let's just keep it down low. What were you doing? I just like <laughs> stripped myself of the apostolic mind state and just dipped. Yeah, he was ready. Like I'm taking off this image. I was still kind of like. I went and bought some shorts, everybody. <laughs> just letting you guys know that that's what happens when you leave the apostolic assembly. You can, as a man, go and buy shorts because you're not allowed to wear shorts. I went and bought some shorts and grow your beard, your facial. I grew my beard out because you're not allowed to have that in the assembly. Now they're 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 changing the rules, but the the view is, hey, that's you know, that's not good. Shave your beard, or hey, shorts, like the world. <laughs> so that's weird. It, it was a little for me. It was a little bit difficult.、Um, one, it wasn't hard for me to to change my wardrobe because I've had leggings. Um, I've never felt convicted. I would just be respectful and wear the proper clothing when it w- was going to church, fellowship nights,、uh, in public, like shopping. Yes, I would still wear my long skirts. The one times I was in a hurry and I was gonna get walk to the park or do a workout, and I had to stop by the store. I, I don't remember running into anybody, but if I did, I didn't feel any conviction. I just know they saw me. And they probably gave me that look, like yeah, they give you the ugly look. That sister, you're wearing pants in public. That's a no no.、Mm-hmm. Um, so I that was that wasn't hard for me. That wasn't hard for me.、Um, wearing makeup, I love wearing makeup in high school. Like when I tell you, I had shelves of makeup. The problem is YouTube. When did, when was YouTube invented? Like、know. early late two thousands. Yeah, early two thousands, I think. Okay, so I didn't have a smartphone at all. The cell phones were barely coming. Like I had a flip phone in freshman year, and it was taken away because I went over my minutes. And、um, I didn't know how to practice and apply makeup very well, like the professionals nowadays. So I didn't feel confident to wear makeup to school, but I had a lot of it, like a lot. Like that's where my money went. It was on makeup, and. I told myself after we left, oh, I'm gonna start getting makeup. No, to be honest, I don't really care for it. And to be honest, till this day, I'm pretty lazy about it. I only do it on special occasions. Until then, I'm still insecure. Like, am I doing this right? Because、uh, there's a lot that goes into prepping your face and wearing makeup. But did I have conviction? No, I didn't. To be honest, no. I, I if you have conviction, that's you. And God pray about it.、Um, jewelry. My mother-in-law gave me beautiful jewelry. I don't wear it often because I'm cleaning most of the time. You know, my rings always fall. Even the ring that my husband gave me, I don't wear when I'm cleaning. It, to those things, I don't know. It wasn't a big deal. What was a big deal for me was seeing my husband making an appointment to get a tattoo. That one, for some reason, really got to me. Like I, I looked at him like, can you like slow down a little bit? Like we just left the church. Can you like hold up a sec? Like so. <laughs> well, when I found the right display of the gospel, I I fell in love with it. And there were some adjustments I had to make to it, but for me,、um, I just I just loved the display so much. I was like, I want this.、Um, 
and it's not a need it's not an addiction um it's an attraction um so i went i got the gospel posted up on my arm and and the, many people the, noticed the, it yeah the entirety of it was like thoroughly done to to be able to walk through the entire gospel with somebody while i'm talking to them and it's interesting because i've actually been uh been glad to be able to have a lot of conversations actually start um as even i'm at work and people are like oh nice tat and i just spell out the whole so i, I spend get, the next 10 I will minutes take messages spelling like, out like hey the did your husband get a new tattoo so i feel like when people notice the little changes in our stories that we post in our social media that we weren't going to the same church anymore we i'm showing off that i'm wearing a little bit of makeup a little bit of jewelry the big one was like showing that i was wearing a wedding band yeah now i wasn't like this but you will see it you would notice yeah if you see a ring on someone's finger i mean i got a rubber one because that's the only one that yeah, makes sense here. to me but um that's that's julie i, I feel like once we start showing little pieces that said that we left the church i feel like people were keeping up really close eye on little details mm -hmm. because when you expose your tattoo and it wasn't like he was like this hi everyone got a new tat yeah. he'll be here and he'll just show a little bit not on not intentionally well, I, never, I never like posted a picture mm -hmm. of it People I, will I, notice I, I, I had one because <laughs> i was reading and what was i reading yeah. uh i was reading uh the quest of full of sure of full assurance it's um a wonderful book that explains uh, why we should be and could be assured and certain of our salvation, mm -hmm. no matter what anxieties take place and in that's life. That's a good one. Because uh, salvation is an entirely accomplished by God work, and uh, he keeps you forever. There is no thing you can do to rip yourself out of mm -hmm. his arms. And you can't earn um, it. You can't earn it, so you can't lose it because there's nothing you can do to keep it either because you couldn't earn it in the first place. Um, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful breakdown. And, I, and it was like a few hours in the, in the tattoo shop. So as I'm reading, uh, I'm getting my arm worked on it. Uh, one of the tattoo people, uh, the assistants took a picture. So that was the only time there was a picture like taken literally me getting the work done. But, um, I, I, I don't like post pictures saying, Hey, check this yeah. out. It's just, you it, can see it cause it's on my arm. But it was kind of interesting that people, we're reaching out so yeah. like hey did you get this done yeah i didn't have anyone reach me everyone I reaches did. no one talks to me <laughs> they just <laughs> they're probably too scared or they don't want to they know that if you reach out to my husband my husband will start a conversation why not <laughs> you messaging me i'm gonna talk because i'll be worried about your soul why you still be doubting you got a soul like you need to see to believe these things but you believe things that you've never seen like feelings and hopes and dreams the future emotions and gravity and suddenly everything you're rejecting makes this whole life a tragedy and i got something to say i got something to say i got something to say to the world